Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this. Move this monitor up. I can not have to sit down. I think. Uh, welcome to this uh, kickoff of our text-based role-playing adventure game, open source learning project. Um, we are Burlington Tech Center, uh, which is located inside Burlington High School. Uh, a class called Programming and Web Development. And we are joined by some wonderful possible mentors who are checking us out and seeing if they want to help. Um, Marguerite, who just introduced herself from Game Theory, will actually be coming here. Will you be coming or just Shannon? No, I should be there. Yeah, and she's going to be having you guys test out a game uh, that they're making. And in return, she will give you lots of pizza, I believe. So that is the way that you feed software developers. In the old days, I think it was Sunkist Orange Soda and Cheetos, but we've evolved uh, since then. Um, and as I said, Char oh, Charlie uh, is another uh, computer science teacher, uh, tech teacher that I've known for quite many years. I've done presentations with him in the past about ePortfolios. And he's got a class who, if they like us, may be developing the same thing that we're working on with us. And that gets into this whole idea of what an open source community is. I've been talking to you folks about WordPress as an open source app. And uh, we're trying to make a new open source app that students from all over can play, can give documentation for when they learn how it is that we're making it so we don't have to worry about making all the documentation, can find bugs, and then can actually even contribute their own modules. Um, mm -hmm. One mentor who may be showing up later named uh, AJ, um, says he wants us to have a game in which they're environmental scientists, not just magic users. And I said, well, if you can find some students who want to do that one, you know, we'll take it on. Anyway, so welcome. And uh, we are recording this, and hopefully some more people will be popping on at later points, and then I don't have to continue to admit them and forget that they're asking. So I'm going to go to PowerPoint right now, and I'm going to make this part of the recording. Hopefully that works. Uh, add in just a moment. Uh, uh, record. Click to begin recording. And view present. Just present. I am used to using Google Slides now, so I've stopped presenting. Home. Present, present. That's the reason why it doesn't want to present. Okay. Hi. So today's talk, we're going to talk about game design for the next uh, 20 minutes or so, I suppose. Uh, then we're going to talk about solution design, which is how we're making the thing that we're going to make. We're going to talk about the human stack, which are who are the people that are going to be involved in this. And then we're going to talk about the technology stack. That's where it's going to get really intense. We're talking about a mean server, a mean stack rather than a lamp stack. And you guys have not heard about that yet. Um, and then we're going to talk about the next steps for our project. And uh, I really want to encourage everybody who's here to ask questions um, and, uh, and interrupt. So first we're going to talk about game design a little bit. And uh, in my thinking about it, and I really want Marguerite to type in as much as you can, because uh, I've not been thinking too long about this. I think that there's three kinds of games. There's action games, which Monopoly would maybe be an example of, where you roll dice and then you do things. That's a, a series of possibilities that you could do. Like, OK, um, I could swap with my two-handed sword, or I could run. <coughs> like, what else could I do? Well, maybe I have another weapon. I could pick that weapon. But there's not a whole lot of things that can happen. So that's like an, an action game. Then there's an adventure game, where it's you're given a much more complicated world that you have to think about and then you have to think about what choices are available to you there. So for example, if you were in space, one choice would not be to go out the airlock and run because you can't run in space. But you could run if we were having an encounter on a football field. So different settings allow for different possible responses. And there's also this idea, idea of navigation where you have some agency you can move around. Then there's the idea of role-playing games, which you have to play a role that you have some role in making. And based on who you are, you do different things. 
and I'm going to suggest that Dungeons & Dragons, which is my frame of reference, being a dungeon master from way back, contains all of these three things. But it doesn't mean that the games we design have to all be like that. So why text-based? If we were graphic designers, the class down the hall, we might make fancy, lovely, lovely things, but we're not. And if we get all focused on trying to do text-based gaming, we're going to have to get deep into code and stay there. And I want us and our partners to have different opportunities to share ideas with us at all levels. So I'm my first premise for this work is that it's going to be a text-based game. That said, it can be a text-based game in a console. So here's a text-based action game. The person says, slice troll. Those are the things that they try to do. Um, that's all they seem to try to do. And uh, then they die because they didn't get the right dice roll. Kind of boring. Um, here's one where um, we go into more possibilities. An adventure game has more potential for conceptual creativity than an action game. So in an action game, you always have the same setup. You always have the same possibilities. But in an adventure game, you're given different situations with different possibilities. I'm going to pause now. Marguerite, uh, do you want to add anything? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say, so like, I'm also a dungeon master. Uh, I love D&D &D for a lot of different reasons. I would say that a lot of, a good way that people I've heard break down D&D &D is that D&D &D is about three things primarily. It's about battle, which you have to acknowledge is an interesting strategic mechanic that exists in the game, but it's also about investigation is a key part, just learning a world and looking at your surroundings and seeing how you can interact with it. And then character, so it's about being able to interact with other people. So, you know, there's just basically, when you're looking at game design, you want to think, uh, to sum it up super quickly, like all basic game design schools will teach you that there's three things that go into game design. There are mechanics, which is how I physically interact with my space. There are aesthetics, which is how the world looks and feels around me. And there are dynamics, which are things like the music and the additional cues that help me interact with my space. Um, there can I, can are, I pause for a you know... Pause for a sec. Eli, yeah. would you do your note-taking thing? Yeah, I can. So what are those three things again, Marguerite? They are mechanics, aesthetics, and dynamics. And if you look up any, like, Game Design 101, you'll get a nice good breakdown of what those different things sort of imply. But it's basically just the idea of when you're playing a game, it's different than, for example, writing a book or making a movie because mechanics are how I physically interact with the space and how I impose my will on that space, which is what makes games a special environment. And then aesthetics are universal to many art forms, right? It's the look and feel and the immersion that I get from a specific space. And then dynamics are things that are also sort of specific to games like music and effects that make it feel really immersive. So that's just a quick, like if you want to do just a quick deep dive into game design, just looking up those things and getting some thoughts on what they mean is a really good one. And then I would also just say that no matter how simple a game, you can make it as complicated as you want. So, for example, if you are just using text, like if you're just doing a text adventure on like a Commodore 64 and all you have are the letters on your keyboard, I would look up for inspiration a game called Caves of Quud. That's Q-U-D. And Caves of Quud is one of the most amazing procedurally generated worlds. It builds out entire universes, religions, and societies and cultures, all using procedural generation from code and all done with simple little letters on a keyboard. And so the entire world displays as just multicolored symbols like backslash and quote and the letter L and a period. And that game has accomplished as much as like a Skyrim adventure could and in some ways much more. So just as a note in terms of using these spaces for creativity, Never be afraid that you won't be able to fully express yourself if you don't have all the aesthetics on hand that other art teams do because mechanics and dynamics can go a really long way and there's tons of people who have done groundbreaking work. Caves of Quad came out last year and people are still exploring these spaces using the most basic tools. It's about what you do with the tools, not necessarily the level of the accomplishment. So there's a lot of cool potential and a lot of good things that can be done. Yeah, an, ex an expression I like is constraint is the mother of creativity. Yep, for you sure. Get, if you get a big blank canvas and you have to paint something, it's kind of hard. But if you have a yeah. canvas with lots of stuff on it, things can, you can suggest. Let's see if we can apply those three words that Marguerite just introduced to us as we go through this presentation, because I think we're going to be able to apply them immediately. So I'm going to go back to where I'm displaying it. Uh, slideshow. 
uh, where's present um, current slide so a first person shooter I guess what's creative is the places where you can run to and the things that you can hit but an adventure game is a lot more creative than that um, adventure games have stories and my guess is that COD has a whole big story that has been built out behind it. Yes, Joe? Which is actually something I like. But my personal preference for a game, which if I go play it... And when, you, when you're going to come and speak, can you come and stand up and talk loud because the microphone is facing me? So, go ahead. Uh, my personal preference for a game is a game with good story. When I go onto, the, onto whatever store I'm looking for, I'm trying yep. to find a really good game that has yeah. a story that could either last me a long time or is just interesting enough where you can replay it and yeah. have an entirely different story. Cool. Yeah. Um, so writing that story obviously is, uh, I'm going to go check my, uh, th this trying to mix back and forth between Hangout and uh, uh, and uh, PowerPoint is going to be di definitely dicey. Yeah, so this what whole writing mean? of the story is something that people can do who don't do any coding at all. If we can hook an English classroom somewhere and say, hey, we need a story written for the game, and they want to be a part of it, that's open source allows for that. So if we're going to this um, sort of story flow chart, you might say, I've, I've expanded this little piece, and you can see that a much larger, they're having simple little words for the things that happen, but there would be much more bigger, complicated things. So if you're playing a game like this, you'd have to know which scene index or which action index you were at, right? If you're at 38, then you know you have the choice of 73 or 72. And if you get to 66, maybe that's the escape shrunk. Actually, maybe these are the endpoints, right? So 72 is the witch dies, and 73 is you escape because you shrunk. So in one choice, maybe you drank something and you got smaller, and the other one, maybe you pushed it on the witch. Who knows? But this is the sort of conceptual background that can make even a text game very interesting. Now, in the old days, a text game, you could kind of move east, west, north, and south, and then you'd go into rooms, and maybe there'd be a monster which you'd attack, and then maybe there'd be a, uh, some treasure that you could take. You could do a text game, and we could design a console for it. This is one that's based on Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, and I guess the advantage of a console is that not only do you have the stuff you have on your keyboard, but we can add our own special things that you get to do. So if we were doing a, if somebody suggested a section in our game where they have a different console, you'd go to a different web page, and we design that web page to have different buttons on it. And people could now be clicking those buttons instead of just having to do text-based entry. That's cool. I have, I'd, I'd love to see us do that. And Maybe our team is the team that goes and comes up with that idea of a console time when you're playing along and all of a sudden there's a new console and you're like, wow, what's this? Oh, we're doing something in space. Or maybe another team does that. That's the beauty of open source is that we can push the boundaries of this wherever we want to. So what are those three items that Marguerite talked about, Eli? What? The three words that she used? Dynamics, aesthetics, mechanics, aesthetics, and dynamics. Okay. So which of those words do you think applies to it's more interesting if we make a console maybe at different points? Which of those three words? Dynamics, yeah. aesthetics, that, and mechanics. Dynamics. Anybody? So aesthetics isn't a word you use very often. You may use anesthetics, but that's only if you're going to have your teeth pulled out. But aesthetics is appearance. So if you're playing along with a game and you've been just doing text-based and all of a sudden it zooms out and you're now having a console, aesthetics changes, and that's cool. And when we want to change the aesthetics of a web page, we use CSS to do that. Now how about mechanics? We can do different things now because we have a console. That's going to be your JavaScript that says, oh, when I click this button, this kind of thing happens. Uh, that was mechanics. So we're left with dynamics, I think. Marguerite, can you explain the difference between mechanics and dynamics again in this context? Yeah, so dynamics, dynamics are sort of the stuff that's in the middle, right? So it's like when the character completes a mechanic, how the world reacts and interacts with it. And so if you're extending your metaphor there, Bram, I think you could even compare dynamics to some database 
language, right? Because it's what's understanding how the player is reacting to the mechanics, and then it is correlating that and presenting changes in the world. Great. I would actually use the word logic myself yeah. for that. It's a smaller word, and uh, it's basically, if this happens, what, do, what are the options? What can happen there? So in our very simple program that we wrote earlier today, the logic was, if I ask our function for a random number between 1 to 6, it can give us back a number between 1 to 6. It's not going to give us anything else. What are we going to do with that? That's the next question. All right. Now, I found a site of Debian games. Debian is a version of Linux that if anybody wants to who has a Debian computer, and we have three Debian computers here, you could stay after class someday and go and find them and find one to inspire us. But Marguerite already helped us and said we should go and check out Quid. Uh, what's the platform for Quid? God, what was it written in? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but I would highly recommend watching some playthroughs. It's, it's very cool. Okay, so they can just go to YouTube and watch people play Quid. Yeah, yeah, but it's also on Steam. It's on Steam, so you can get it off of Steam. Um, but, yeah, playthroughs are great. Polygon's done some good playthroughs. A bunch of other people have done some good playthroughs. And Brian Bucklow, who's the guy who developed, is pretty active on Twitter and also shares playthroughs that people do uh, and, you know, a lot of just his thinking on the whole process. Cool. Um, Josh is here uh, from uh, Burlington Code Academy, and I wanted to stand in front of the screen and say yeah, something. Yeah, one of the... One of the challenges that we do that's pretty similar to this, and we don't have like a multiplayer aspect, but you could go back to the start of text-based adventure games and do something similar to um, Zork. And Zork is really easy to find in a text-based environment, so it's all command line, but there are web ports of it. So you can play Zork on the internet like right now without having to install anything. And it has a really vast library inside of it of different adventures that you can go take and different paths that you can take um, in order to complete it. Um, and uh, if you want to play a really long game, you can play NetHack, which is similar, but um, goes uh, into much more depth of like adventures that you can take. So at the very end of something like NetHack, you sort of ascend into this higher level being. And it's sort of along the same lines as RPG Adventure, so but it's all text-based as well. So just a couple more recommendations that you might want to look at for inspiration. Cool. And both of those can be played online, I believe. People have ported those to the web. Marguerite probably knows a lot more about them than I do. I've only played them a little bit. So Thank you, Josh. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, so um, we're jumping a little bit ahead if we start talking about the technology. But since we're on the web, we have the opportunity to go and switch to different kinds of interfaces that folks who are just making a text-based game uh, in an operating system don't have the opportunity to do. That could be a rabbit hole for us where we go into things that are too complicated. We'll have to see. We're joined by Simcha Wood. Um, I'm going to make him big screen right now so you guys all see him. Um, everybody wave to Simcha. Hi, Simcha. Of course, he can't see you waving because, um, you know... The, the camera is pointing the other way. But Simcoe is a friend of mine from Greenfield, where I actually live in Massachusetts, and where I go back every uh, weekend. And Simca was and is still doing uh, copywriting and editing and said to himself, you know, I think I'd like to make some more money and learn how to code. And so he's been studying the stuff that makes this website. Simca, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, why you're involved and what you're thinking and feeling about it? Yeah, sure. Um, so can you hear Much me? louder. What's that? Loud as you can get. You're a little okay. quiet. Okay. All right. Um, and you? So yeah. yeah uh, like Bram had said, I, I, um, Oh, we're good. Okay. I've been working as an editor, uh, with, uh, Marion Webster for, oh, about 12, 13 years now. Um, I don't know, in about a year, year and a half ago, I had decided I wanted to, uh, start earning more money, um, you know, and programming was something I had sort of done as a hobby, you know, quite a while back. Um, so I've been out of it for, you know, a long time, you know, pretty much, I think, since I had been working for Merriam-Webster. Um, so what I started doing is uh, I decided, you know, just, you know, to get back into the game, um, you know, so I start going around looking for resources, uh, you know, trying to figure out, um, 
you know, what languages I, I wanted to learn, you know, sort of uh, what aspects of the technology I was interested in. Um, you know, it was interesting, you know, last time I had really spent much time programming, you know, at that time, yeah, uh, like Node.js wasn't even a thing yet. Your JavaScript was, you know, pretty much uh, something you just use to do some uh, front-end scripting on websites. Um, you know, and as I started getting back into it and, you know, start reading up on, you know, kind of what the trends were, um, you know, what skill sets uh, employers were looking for, uh, at that point, I decided I put most of my focus has been it, uh, with uh, Node.js and, um, you know, and particularly using things like the mean and run stacks, you know, where you're using JavaScript both on the front and back end. And, uh, you know, and I've been, you know, for about the last year now, especially, you know, I've been, you know, trying to spend, you know, quite a few hours each week. You know, just learning. Um, you know, I began by using resources like uh, Free Code Camp and some of those. You know, which are, which are a good place to get down the basics. Uh, you know, then after that, you know, I started hitting books and more recently uh, using uh, some of the courses on Udemy to you know start uh, nailing down you know the more kind of. Uh, detailed detailed and complicated aspects of the, the technology, technology that I'm, you know, interested, interested in working with. Thank you, Simka. So, you know, what we're le learning is, right, he did an, a scan of the workforce and said he thinks that the code that we should be learning, that he should be learning to make money, is the one that we're doing for this game set, this meme. Mongo, mm -hmm. um, uh, A stands for, uh, what does A stand for in meme? Angular. Angular, right? That's the one I know least about, and uh, and Node and uh, and Express. So uh, so that's why we're we're diving into that. And he's going to be our go-to guy, helping us make stuff. Um, but as you see, he's just been learning for a year this stuff too. So we're really going to be depending on our mentors, and we have a few mentors on the call, possible mentors, and other people will be coming in later if he ever gets stuck. Hey, Bram, sorry, real fast. I'm going to have to hop off, but this all seems super cool. I think the deck is awesome, and it seems like a really sweet class. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Marguerite, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Okay, sounds good. Bye-bye. Bye. So why role-playing? Uh, so far, we haven't talked about that piece so much, but it allows for not only programmatic and but also conceptual creativity. And what I mean by that is that... The conceptual creativity is the adventure game part. Yes, Eli. Uh, role building. Role building. I said world building. World building. Yes. So the conceptual stuff is world building. Yes, Ben. You're all wrong. Oh, okay. okay. This is where I want to be. Uh, that uh, conceptual stuff is building worlds, but programmatic stuff means given the role that you have. What can you do that someone else can't do, right? A first-person shooter game doesn't have any role-playing because everybody has the same weapons. But they, then they start evolving, and some people have different weapons, and some people have different armor, and some people can escape in different ways. Well, the more interesting, the more interesting we can have our characters be, maybe the more the game can reflect that. But that makes the program have to be much more responsive. So... This is a slide that has a vast number of links in it that we all want to be able to explore at different points. Um, but it's talking about that there's combat encounters and non-combat encounters. And there's three kinds of non-combat encounters according to uh, that first um, link here on RPG Stack Exchange. Now, guys, I shared the link to the slideshow with you on Google Classroom. So if you want to go to Google Classroom, look at the slideshow and click those links. You're welcome to. Um, it says that you might have different kinds of action, some non-action skill drill uh, building challenges. You know, can you make a, a trap that'll catch a rabbit, I guess? And then strategy and diplomacy, more social interactions. And that may be a place where we either have very complicated non-player characters or we have multiplayer characters. Maybe you have 
people have to decide together what action they're going to take, but they're doing it at a distance. Now, Wyatt, you told me you play a game that does that, right? Where people collaborate on coming up with a solution? Um, it's a collaborative trying to survive. Collaboratively trying to survive. What's the name of it? Well, Call of Duty. Maybe Call of Duty? Yeah, it's the zombies mode more specifically. We just have to try way back to make some zombies to your teams. Okay, Call of Duty zombie mode has some collaborative planning. Anybody else here involved in any games that you are playing with other characters online and deciding what to do? I uh, name it. Um, I have one that I play called Don't, Don't Starve, which is one where you have to cut down trees. and, and Don't and starve. And okay. Monsters come out. I have one called Ark. Ark. Which is one which is full of dinosaurs. Uh -huh. And you quite need a, quite a bit of other people to either tame the dinosaurs or to help not die from them because they do attack you. Mm -hmm. And then I have one more that I've been playing recently that could be multiplayer to choose. And it's called Raft. Raft. It's an early access game. And you can stay on that one to help uh, keep your boat from being torn apart by sharks, help gather resources, and to help ex new, new something new, help explore new big islands that they recently had, which you need a couple people to help search them. Cool. Officially. Galloway. Um, I showed you this book that I just I had with me yesterday, and mm -hmm. it was the Curse of Strahd module for Dungeons and Dragons. Um, that I'm, but that's a desktop game, right? It is. It's a tabletop RPG, but yeah. it's still that collaborative system. Um, yesterday, our rogue went down, so one of the I believe our fighter ran over and poured a healing potion down her throat. Mm -hmm. So that is part of that collaborative action. Cool. So I think that. What we want for our design is to be able to have collaboration at a distance uh, so that we can be playing with other classrooms. So that means it, when we get to that point, finding a way to have multiplayer interactions and then choices to take actions, and maybe with a poll where different people click, what do I want to do next? And as soon as there's a, if they want to go into consensus mode, they all have to pick the same one. And if it's majority mode, then majority wins and they do something. Anyway, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of really great information here. How many people did what I suggested, went to Google Classroom and are now clicking through this? Anybody? I did. One person, two people. I'm probably going to do it Three later, people. right now I'm just trying to... Listen, get very good job. Okay, so Dungeons & Dragons model. I'm just going to uh, uh, quickly go through this. Uh, Galloway's really comfortable with it. You start it by rolling dice, and the dice tell you what your character is able to, to be able to do. Um, so if your character has a lot of strength, probably being a fighter is a good idea. If it has a lot of dexterity, then maybe you want it to be a, uh, a thief or a, uh, um, I don't even, maybe even a magic user, but a magic user really needs to have intelligence because they have to memorize a whole bunch of spells. So you get all of your roles, your ability scores. You can take um, ability scores and modify them. So if you see in this case we have the person who has the most power here in the wisdom category and those are very often the clerics who can basically figure out what has to happen because they're aware of everything that's happening in the environment not just I know a bunch of spells. Like wisdom and intelligence are different. Maybe you haven't come across that yet. Um, but this person probably said you know what I'm gonna take some points off of my strength because if I'm going to be a cleric, I want to be the best cleric I possibly can be. I want to get plus three there. So this is just describing how Dungeons & Dragons handles the role-playing game aspect programmatically. But there's this whole other aspect, which is personal, that you take on a name and personal characteristics, and the people who you're playing with in real life are the ones who get to see that. How we do that in the online forum maybe has just a lot to do with how you express yourself to other characters once you're in multiplayer mode. Let me go check and see if anybody else has tried to join us. Nobody yet. Okay. How are we doing on time? Um, 10.39. I think we're going to be going to be okay. So this is what the, the current version of uh, Dungeons & Dragons looks like uh, online. Lots of fancy graphics, but it's still the same game pretty much. A couple more options. And if you, if you put these three things together, role-playing, text action, and adventure, you could do anything. You don't have to just be in Dungeons & Dragons mode. 
In this, these here are these a comic about some people doing it with a chess game. And they're just adding it and having fun. Um, I'm thinking of uh, Sim City, where you're creating a city and using all the rules of urban planning. Uh, one of our collaborators, AJ, said he'd like to have us do a game that has to do with environmental science, where you go into a situation where something's kind of screwed up in the environment, you have to do something about that. Um, one of my favorite game developers is uh, Tom, uh, what was his last name? Tom. He did a thing called Decisions Decisions, where students would learn about something and then apply it to the game. Those are more educational games. We have space for that. It's all a question of what our core code can do. So now it's time to geek out and talk about the core code. And this is a point where I really want my, uh, ex the experts that are listening in to interrupt me, because I can't see if you raise your hand. So please interrupt me if we get there. So solution design, we have to have a database schema. We have to have code that allows us to create the game on the database. And then we need to have our action logic, which Marguerite called uh, dynamics, I think. Uh, yes, Eli? Honestly, the whole C -U -C -C -R -U -D -E kind of reminds me of, of, the, of, of, the, of the name of the scripting engine. Scripting, script script cre creates creation utility for Maniac Management. I also, also call it S-C-U-M-M for short. Uh-huh. So, uh, and then there's uh, uh, creative uh, medievalism. There's a whole lot of different acronyms, but we're going to get into what this acronym comes up. What this acronym is very shortly. So first, that's the schema. If I take the sentence, <clears throat> a character on a quest meets an opponent in a room, and there's an encounter of the type melee, and I parse that into what things are involved, I end up with a model for a database. Let's move through this. And this is, as far as your students go, the most important thing for you to get from this whole presentation is what I'm about to say. So put your thinking cap on and stop looking at the uh, games that I had you send you before. Give me your eyeballs. Okay. A character. Well, if we're playing a game, then we're playing a character, which means we have to have a representation in the database for us. What's our name? What are our powers? Where are we located? And the character is on a quest. Now, I made the quest a slightly less yellow word because that's more advanced. That might be you could be in a dungeon trying to kill monsters and get treasure. You could be in a forest trying to make an alliance with a kingdom to be able to marry the daughter and get the Holy Grail. All different kinds of things could be happening. But you meet an opponent. So that means we're going to need to have a database of opponents. Beholders, dragons, uh, liars, you know, presidents of the United States. And those opponents have different qualities that affect what kind of things can happen when you meet them. A room. So where are you meeting them? Are you meeting them in a place where there are video cameras? Are you meeting them in a place where there are weapons lying around? Are you meeting them in a bank? So we have a database that has a table of rooms. We have a table of encounters. What kinds of things happen when these three things happen together? So if we say this character Ben's character, you know, Joe the Magnificent, goes and meets Donald Trump in the Oval Office, right? Now we're going to have an encounter. What occurs there? Well, we need to have a link to the character, to the room, and to the opponent, and then we need to say what the outcome is. And we store that in the database, too. We're going to get more into that in a couple of seconds. Anybody on the outside want to say anything? Let, let, let us know. I found this online, which was a sort of map of how things could work where your level would be a room that you might be in, and the quest might be the overall setting of uh, what's happening. And you've got a player, which is the character. Your, a non-player character is your opponent. And your task is the encounter. As you can see, this player, Dan, completed level one. He's now in level two. He's in quest one. And he's on task two. He's going through this. Everybody has to go through, in this game, they all have to go through the same stuff. Or actually, no, they don't have to go through them. They can move ahead. So he's going on to hitting non-player character three without having done everything he needed to do with non-player character two. But this diagram implies a database that has tables, player table, quest table, level table, NPC table. This is what a relational database 
diagram looks like, and we can make them a lucid chart, by the way, and we will. So you've got your actors or your characters. You've got your classes, which what kinds of characters they are. We know that our magic users have special powers and also special weaknesses. What are the skills they have? What weapons are they having? And each one of these has a index, a number associated with the record in that table, so that we join all those things together and we have a new table of, well, this character, this actor has this class and this weapon. So we take the ID of the actor, the ID of the class, the ID of the weapon, and that becomes a person. I found this program that allows you to design database tables and then export them as MySQL code, which we would have been able to use if we were going to do this in MySQL. But since we're doing it in uh, MongoDB, which is a different database format, I don't know whether that you can convert SQL to Mongo. Do you know, Josh? You cannot. You cannot. No. Uh, Mongo is a document database. So instead of having uh, tables, you have documents which have sub-documents. Um, and so it's not going to be the same kind of relational model that you're used to if you're coming from a background in SQL. Can students, on an abstract level, design this way and then convert it, or should they, do they actually have to think a whole different way? You might want to think in a little different way. Um, the, offer, the, the alternative is there's nothing stopping you from using MySQL with JavaScript. It'll just be another dialect of programming language that you'll have to teach. Since SQL is a set-based programming language, and something like Mongo is a document-based programming language, Documents map fairly well to objects in JavaScript, and so a lot of people coming from JavaScript have less of an <coughs> impedance mismatch between their concepts. If they're moving from just learning about objects to learning about documents, they're quite similar. Whereas if you're going from just learning about objects to learning about relations, there's quite a bit different between the two. And that's why some programmers prefer Mongo, but there's nothing stopping you from using MySQL if you choose to go that route. Great. You know, so I was having a discussion with AJ, and he was saying, whatever you do, don't do PHP. Because that's a deprecated language in a lot of circles right now. Uh, a lot of sloppy things have been done with it, although we're still using it for WordPress. But it sounds from what Josh is saying is we can go to the Node.js route, Node, React, Angular, the whole thing but pick MySQL instead of Mongo. You could use MySQL. You could use Postgres, which is another open source database. Um, there's other ones. I'm, I imagine that there are programs that would provide educational hosting for you. Mm -hmm. So I don't know those specifics, but I know that lots of people use JavaScript with SQL if that's something you want to teach in your curriculum. Yeah, I really love the visual display of database relationship tables. So as far as my instinct right now is that we might want to actually go the route of Node um, MySQL. Um, Simcha, do you want to? This would make you very unhappy if we did that, right? Uh, oh, I, 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 I would survive it. It wouldn't be uh, that big of an issue. Um, I mean, I, mean, I, I do know, know based on, on uh, my, my past, past experience, experience like, working specifically with. Uh, text-based text -based games. games. I don't know if you remember, if you remember um, like MUDs from, from the 90s sure. and the early, early 2000s. 2000s. Um, you, know, you know, I do see, see some, some advantages, advantages to a document-based uh, database. database. Um, Uh, again, again I, you, know, you know, largely because of the way it maps so well onto objects. objects. Um, you, know, you know, it becomes, becomes a great way, way. you know, for, for example, example, if you're using, you know, you know say, say like, uh, MySQL database, database, you know, you might have, have you know, you, you would have, for example, a table of characters, of characters and, um, you know, characters, if they have certain, you know, items in their inventory, inventory you know, if you were also, also storing those in it, that would be on a separate, you know, table and you would link to that. Uh, with, something with something like Mongo, Mongo what, what you would do is those would just, just you, would you would have a character doc, each character, character would have its own document in the inventory, you know, the entire, entire objects. objects. 
of their, their inventory, for example, would just be stored as sub-documents uh, you know, with, with that, that character. character. Um, um, you, know, you, you might have a, a you, might you might structure things, things you know, depending on uh, you know, how, how you want to do it. You know, for example, like, like as, as you're designing the game world, world you, know, you know, again, you might have, you know, rooms or whatever, or whatever you want to refer to them at, you know, sort of each individual space that the characters can operate in. in. You know, you know, might have, have its own document, document and, and that would include, include you know, um, you know any, any of the treasure, treasure that's in the room, room any of the, you know, you know potential threats, threats that are in the room. room. Um, um, you know, you know so, so, so in some, some ways, ways, I, I personally, personally think, you know, for, at, at least, least for me anyways, it's, it's you, know, you know, I find it much easier to sort of visualize, um, how, how the database, database would, would look, look for, a for a game like this. Like this. Um, okay. You know, I, I, I think you know, there's a certain intuitiveness to it that you don't necessarily find, you know, with like MySQL. My you know, don't, don't get me wrong. There, there's a lot of things that, you know, MySQL does, does much better than Mongo does. does but. Well, I just need to learn because I don't know it. So there's no reason for me to have an attachment to one way or another if I don't know the other way. Yeah. yeah. And but it's but you think for a project like this, this Mongo, Mongo does, does you know, you know, have some advantages, advantages just, just in terms of how it's structured. Cool. So uh, we'll still have that as our our default idea of how we're moving, but we might decide to, to fork it at some point and have one class doing it as a MySQL version and one class doing it as a Mongo version. Uh, let's find out. So you could also use different storage engines for different purposes. Different storage engines. So you mean you could have both MySQL and Mongo in the same code base? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, you just use them. You can have a different backend object that talks to each one. So if you have certain things that fit better in a relational model, you could use a relational model for that. If you have certain things that would fit better in Mongo, you could have those talk to Mongo. And then you could have some sort of a piece of uh, some program that would uh, be able to reconcile those two stores and give you an object that has the data getting fetched from both of them. That's called the repository pattern. Uh -huh. So you can you can look up the repository pattern in JavaScript. It's pretty common. Eli, can you write down that we should look up repository pattern? Yeah, um, I can do that. So, the core could have both patterns, or the core could be all in Mongo, but some people could do a MySQL module that they bring onto it. Yeah. OK, cool. So let's look at the code. We got character CRUD, room CRUD, opponent CRUD, and, and encounter CRUD. And CRUD stands for, Eli, create, read, update, and delete. So if you have what? CRUD stands for create, read, update, and delete. So if I have a database that's storing my characters, I need to be able to create a character. I need to be able to read it. So if I say I'm logging on, it says, oh, you're Joe the jumping and whatever's true about you. Yes, Eli? I'm actually climbing my, my doki doki little dog. And let's just say it gets actual li literal. It, let's just say that eventually call it comes literal. I'm not quite following. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not trying to spoil things since I'm not trying to. He doesn't know about it. I don't know about your reference. That's OK. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm yeah, old. Yeah, I, I, I listen to old and watch old things. Um, so uh, your rooms, you want to be able to create your rooms when you're building the game. Then when you enter into a room, we have to read what's going on in that room. Then when you want to make something new to the room that's already there, you have to update the room. And if you decide you don't want the room in your database anymore, you delete the room. So those four actions, create, read, update, delete, are the major ways to interact with a database if you're in code. So one of the first core things we need to do when we're writing code is to write programs that can do that to each of the tables that we're relating to in our database. And, or documents instead of tables if we're talking Mongo, right? Because you don't use tables in Mongo. Yeah, I think of the any storage engine as uh, a collection of entities. Mm -hmm. And those entities could be stored as tables, or they could be stored as documents, or some uh, some other style. There are, there are other kinds of databases called 
um, uh, graph databases that store their entities as nodes in a graph. Like when you had that graph of rules, mm -hmm. um, you could imagine that being a, a database of different pathways that could be taken through the through the, um, the adventure. Okay. Yeah. So we'll try to use the word entities. It's a more uh, what's, what's the word? Generalized. A generalized or a, yeah, um, abstracted term. Yeah. So after we have those basics, we might want to create quests, non-melee encounters, those non-combat encounters we talked about, and maybe even different universes so that if Ben and Hassan and Joe are all online having one interaction, but maybe Eli and other Ben and Wyatt and Andrew are in a different universe, they could be... If, if Joe goes into a particular room and steals the, you know, the wand of disappearance, in the other universe, that wand is still in the room. But in Joe's universe, it's gone because he took it, so Hassan can't get at it. Right? So that's the advantage of being able to have different universes at the same time once we have multiplayers. So action logic, that has to do with what uh, Marguerite was calling dynamics, I believe. Um, and we have to decide what are the different kinds of things that can happen. You remember what happens in The Hobbit where... Uh, 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 Bilbo has to try to get through a door, right? And he has to and he has to answer a riddle to get through the door. So, The Hobbit and and I guess probably um, uh, Harold po uh, Harry Potter, all of those provide us lots of different models for different kinds of encounters that we would then be able to abstract logic from. So you can abstract the logic of there's a door and you have to answer a riddle to get to the door. That's easy to code. We could code that tomorrow. Um, maybe things happen that the longer it takes you, the more hit points you lose because you're standing in a microwave stream that's being created by Russians in Cuba. Um, so let's talk about, sorry, just making some current event references. So uh, human stack, uh, who are the people that are going to be involved in this? Because it's open source, I'm going to just do a quick check-in to see if anybody else is trying to join us in our... Uh, uh, hang out. No, nobody else yet. else yet. Yeah, we lost Marguerite. Uh, so we want to talk about the whole community and then the particular people that we want to get to be involved in this community. Mentors like Marguerite and Josh. Other classrooms like Charlie's classroom and other classrooms that we may have. And this is going to exist for a long time. The beauty of making it an open source community is that even when you guys leave and graduate, this gets to stay. All the aspects of it get to stay. Because if we're collaborating with each other remotely, then we have to make digital representations of what we know and what we're doing so other people can participate. With comments and stuff? Yeah. And then, yeah, so that's the whole point about commenting code, right, is that other people can read it. So people can come after and have everything they need to participate with us which is something that uh, is going to make this a very powerful opportunity. Um, okay, hello, Robert. We have another possible classroom now. Uh, Robert's joining us. Um, hi. You want to say anything, Robert? Um, sure. sure. Hello. And uh, you Robert, you're calling us from Casablanca, I see. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and uh, what classroom do you teach out there in uh, Casablanca? I teach, I teach a 7th seventh seventh grade, grade programming. programming. Seventh grade programming. So uh, we, we have a recording of this, which I'll share with you later. But we'll, we're going to talk about how actually you could have an English class doing a design of the adventure without having to know any coding at all. So um, I'm going to, since we, uh, we're we going to keep moving forward in it, but I'd like, love to have you stop, share something, or ask any questions without waiting for me to ask, does anybody have any questions, OK? OK. OK. Cool. So back to where we are. So why is it open source? We need a lot of help from a lot of different people. And that means we want to make it possible for people to come in, see what we're doing, and participate. If it was closed source, then you'd have to be, every new person would have to be given a, la, uh, you know, a key to come in and see what we're doing. And they may not decide to come in and see what we're doing. It's like if you want to go to a party and you can't see in the window, you can't decide whether you want to go to the party. So pretty much there's two kinds of parties. Those that have the window shades open, where you can see how much fun people are having, having and decide if you want to go into that party. And those with the window shades closed, where you have to hear that it's a good party, and they say, well, you have to pay $20 to come into this party, and you have to decide whether to pay the $20 or not. 
what I used to do in college was just walk around with a couple of large pizzas, and then I'd go into the party, and they didn't know me, but they wanted the pizza. Kind of worked. Uh, okay, so uh, in an open source community, you have many levels of, par of participation. I've talked this a little bit before. You have your core team, where the people that are making the code that every other bit of code has to work into. If we didn't have core, then it wouldn't be an open source project. It would just be a melee of coders all trying to fight each other. But if you have a core, then you say, hey, you guys over there and wherever you did it, you made this code. We've checked it out, and we like it. So we're going to make whatever changes to our core code that we need to make to make it possible to play that. You have your people who are <laughs> saying, I'm OK with the new changes that we're going to make. And then there's the initiator, who is me and us, who are starting this whole thing out. Co-developers are people who may be in other places, like mentors or other classrooms. And then active users. Those are the people who are going to be playing these games, giving us feedback about bugs, helping make documentation. And passive users who are playing the games and they're not saying anything to us. But everybody, even the passive users, because they generate information about what they're doing and what's happening, are all helping. That's the beauty of an open source community. Everybody's helping. Yay. Whereas in the Microsoft community, the people who uh, get hacked version of Windows and don't pay Microsoft aren't helping Microsoft. They want you to pay about money. So very many different skills involved in this. People who are thought partners, people who are coders, people who want to make a mobile version of the game. But what we need to sign up to this is we need people who know Node and Mongo because Simca is only be doing it for a year and eventually he's going to get past what he's able to do. Infrastructure keepers, um, right now Simca and I are kind of handling that, mostly Simca is handling that, but we need to make sure that the servers are properly provisioned so that they can support whatever level of activity we're doing and that they're backed up so that if we have a catastrophe we don't lose all of our work. Game designers like Marguerite from Game Theory, Core code keepers, again, that's kind of related to the infrastructure. Guest teachers, so if Josh wanted to come in and give us a lesson on something that uh, he's teaching his folks over at the Burlington Code Academy, he comes in, we record that. That's available on our repository of uh, lectures. New module makers, other classrooms that are coming in and say, well, we want to make a module about environmental science from those partner classes. Front end designers who want to make a, a console for some new game. Uh, Curriculum designers who actually want to make teaching games or want to make a curriculum that helps people enter into this community because it can be very overwhelming when a whole lot of stuff is going on already. You guys aren't going to have that problem because you're getting in the ground floor. And our beta testers and users. So we need to get sign up from all these people. So if you're watching this presentation, at the end of it, there's going to be a link to a form. Share that form with people that you can help help us get started by having other people join. But there's two big groups, the skilled mentors and the learning partners. Now let's talk about the technology stack. And this is where I get out of my element and uh, really want people to interrupt me when I say something wrong. So why mean, which is MongoDB, Express, Angular, and Node, rather than LAMP, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. So the back end is the thing that changes all this stuff, because the front end is always the same, right? I mean, how we design the front end could be different, but we're always dealing with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. React is a way of making the theme from the front end more interesting and easier to make, I think. Is there anyone on the call who wants to talk about React? Josh, come on up. Uh, I'll just yeah. uh, correct one, one little thing. So Angular yeah. is actually a front end oh. um, here. Uh, so Angular would substitute for React if you chose to go ah. with Angular. React and Angular serve a similar purpose. Um, React, That's why somebody said Mern rather than Mean. Exactly. Exactly. So um, uh, my suggestion is to go with React, but some other people might might disagree, and that's fine. Um, I think that they're both suitable for what you're trying to do. Um, I found that React has a little bit of an easier learning curve than than Angular, because Angular is a big system built uh, designed for building big pieces of software. React is a smaller library, so it has a smaller area to understand. Um, and other than that, uh, I think everything here is, is correct. Um, 
and uh, that's just my my little two cents. Well, actually, we already are doing it with uh, React. Okay. So I just, you know, again, not knowing anything, I, I came across this mean, and I said, mean, that sounds like a word I know. I'm going to use that word. That's how silly, you know, people who don't know anything are. But that's what the advantage of an expert is helping us get solid. So I can make that change right now. Of course, this, this change is not going to affect uh, what's on line, but it will. Okay, but uh, there we are. And back to our slide. Uh, slide show, current slide. So this is the point where uh, I'm just making stuff up. As far as I can tell, Node is supposedly much faster and more scalable than PHP and Apache or something. I mean, it is, but the benefit for all of you is you only have to learn one language. Yes, yeah, so JavaScript being similar to Node. If you can use JavaScript, then you can go onto the server and figure out what's happening there. And that's, that's the main reason here. And then for Simca, also, Node plays better. This is a review for you guys about how LAMP works. That you have a web page with a URL on it, or rather a browser with a URL on it, and that URL goes over to the server. The server says, do I have a cached version of this page that I'm allowed to share? If it doesn't, then it's got to create that page. It goes to its PHP, like WordPress, goes to the database. Together, they decide what the page should be, and then they send that back. What's a denial of service attack, anybody? Yes, Eli. Like sends to me server requests at once. Right. Too many server requests at once because it's, it's dealing with them one at a time and getting very, very confused, and soon it can't do anything and it stops your server. I'm wondering if a DDS uh, happens less frequently with a node server. Does anybody know? You can nuke any server. You can nuke any um, server. The, the general way to avoid something like that is you have to use a, um, a service like uh, Cloudflare, which can block those requests uh, before they reach your backend. OK. Yeah. So, so this isn't necessarily an argument for, uh, for security, but it is the old way that people did business and how LAMP works and how WordPress works. Now, Node.js works very differently instead of having these sequential threads. But all I have is this diagram. Uh, would you be willing to talk this diagram through a little bit, Jeff? Yeah, yeah, sure. And stand over here if you would. Yeah, absolutely. So um, here's the general idea. So you have lots of users who are trying to use your application. Um, and they all send over to your web server. Uh, your web server is running on a physical device, which is oftentimes called also a server or a host. Um, and that's where your, your Node.js code is running. And what Node.js does, um, JavaScript is not multi-threaded, um, which threads, I don't know if you, have you covered threads with your students yet? Okay. So um, imagine uh, that you are at the desk of a bank, okay? And you are the only person at that, at that bank's desk. And you are the person that responds to all the customers. So in this case, you're the only thing that can respond to people coming in and asking questions of the bank. Um, and so you're standing in as that one representative. A multi-threaded program can have uh, many representatives that are all at that front line trying to answer questions. And one of the difficulties with that is that if those representatives have to go and turn around after the initial question and go to a central desk and like move some stuff around in order to answer the question. Maybe they have to look up the customer's information in a register. Maybe they have to enter some information on a calculator. And then they turn back around to go back to the customer. Another representative might go back and mess up their work and change things around. Okay, So it takes a lot more coordination of your data in order to manage something that's multi-threaded because there's many representatives that are all trying to interact with the same data on the system at the same time. What JavaScript does is it has a single threaded model. Um, it's what's known as a green thread. And what a green thread is, is that um, when the JavaScript uh, server re gets the request, um, it has complete control over its entire set of data. Now it can behave like there's more than one representative. 
And the way that it does that is that Node turns around and talks to the operating system and says, hey, operating system, go and do this thing for me. Like, go read a file or go and make this database request or go and make a network request out to some other server on the internet. And when you're done, run this code. And that is called um, callback-based uh, concurrency, uh, which is what allows Node to be really fast in responding to requests. But what you cannot do is ever block the main thread. Because if you block the main thread in Node, then any other requests that are coming in, any other representatives that are coming into the bank, can't get their requests serviced. Because the representative is there trying to finish up their work before they can go back and get um, the answer to their first clients. And uh, what you want to do is to allow the one representative that Node has to go and turn around and then pitch that work off to somebody else in the back of the bank. And then that person in the back of the bank is done. They come back to the representative and they go, oh, here's what you asked for you know, 15 milliseconds ago give this back to the customer who is asking for it. And that representative turns around and gives it back. So Node has to use this thing called callbacks, and there's other ways to make it um, fast as well, but they all are built on top of callbacks. So even though they might be called other things like promises or async and await, they're all built on top of callbacks. Cool. Yep. So if I want to just simplify this, and maybe I'll be wrong when I try to, but I'll make my best shot at it. We got the bank with one ATM in it, and we got the banks with 10 ATMs in them. And if there's one ATM, there's a big long line of people waiting to use that ATM. If there's 10 ATMs, there's always everybody's at an ATM. So I think I'd rather have the bank that has lots of ATMs. But if all those ATMs are connecting to one guy with his hand on the cash, then you, all these people are going to be standing at the ATMs waiting to get their money and being very unhappy. Whereas if there's 10 people going out and some people are trying to get a balance inquiry and some people are trying to get their cash and some people are trying to transfer money, then each person at whichever ATM you're at has to wait a lot less and gets their stuff done fast. And it may turn out that uh, I can hire different people to do different things by knowing, well, you're not going to interfere with getting the money if all you're doing is getting me a balance inquiry. Or you're not going to interfere with the balance inquiry if all you're doing is going to get, you know, transfer money, do some other kind of thing. So I would guess that that single thread has to be very smart to know what it's going to go and do that's not going to interfere with the back end. The, the nice thing is that the single thread is very dumb, oh. but the operating system is very smart. And so the single thread just receives the requests, and it is a queue to the operating system. And then the operating system figures out oh, I have a process trying to read the same file. I have a process trying to write to that same file. What should I do? And Linux, is written by a lot of very smart people, is able to manage those tasks. And then when it has those answers, turn around and give them back to the cashier who's handling the money. So at some point, it might be interesting to see a presentation on the, the evolution of these systems and why we went from multi-thread to single thread. Like, there's a very interesting uh, thing about why Railroad tracks have the rails at the same distance apart from each other, and it has to do with the Romans. But uh, uh, this is about as deep and geeky as I can get to. Uh, so what are the parts that we have right now? We've got a GitHub repo, which you guys all know because you're using GitHub, yes? Uh, the, the GitHub lab. On GitLab, right? Yeah. So GitHub is, a, uh, is the web version. Uh, GitLab is a structure for supporting Git repositories. So I, I wrote GitHub rather than GitLab, but there is a thing called GitLab. We have a MongoDB server, which is where the database is hanging out. It's made by MLab, and we get it for free, I think. And then we have a development and production server called Heroku. And one of the cool things that Heroku can do is actually automatically pull stuff from our GitHub and put it onto the server. And that means that we're never getting code that we don't have a version of, and we can always go back. So it's very, very handy. So Simca set this whole system up for us, and it's going to make it possible for us to like not step on our own feet too often. We may need some other things as well at some point. I don't know. We'll find out. 
so this is what our GitHub directory looks like. It's uh, github.com slash bt.org slash btc dash programming dot rpg. And you'll see that there's a thing called API roots, and that's if you want to test how this thing works by uh, downloading something that connects to the server. And then there's a thing called mockup where you can see what it looks like and learn HTML, CSS on it, but it's not going to actually connect to the server. And then everything else is just the server and all the code and everything that we need. So here's our Mongo server. Here's our virtual server. You can see that he's uh, posting things. Um, and here's, I just made a character. I based it on a run DMC song, uh, but uh, that's up there on our database right now. And that's, it looks like very nice because he was using React, uh, which makes, or, or he was using Express or React to make that. Uh, it's probably React. That's React. So React makes all this nice stuff. But your guys, you're just learning CSS now, or just about to. So you're not going to be able to make things that are this cool. So what he then did was he made. Yeah, a, yeah the, uh, the CSS, CSS right, now right now on that is actually, actually uh, using, using Bootstrap. Bootstrap. Oh, this, for the, the, this one is for the, for the this is Bootstrap. Yeah, you yeah. The, the CSS, CSS is uh, Bootstrap. bootstrap. Okay. It's, a, it's, it's just a way to, um, you know, that, you know, that way, way I, did, I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time, time you, know, you know, sort of mucking, mucking with the layout and stuff. And stuff. Bootstrap's so Bootstrap's just a quick way um, to put up a, you know, responsive, you know, moderately appealing layout. Great. But when we start learning this on our own, we're going to use something as simple as this. And you guys are all familiar with the console, because you've been using it for JavaScript. And you can see that there's a style sheet that's telling it that we want this box to be gray and maybe even have a shadow on it. Um, and then there's JavaScript code stuck in here. You got to take off, Josh? I do have to head off. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you. All right. I look forward to speaking to you. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Hey, good to meet you. Yeah, nice. nice to meet you all. Take care. Good luck. Have fun. So, so, some, so one of the next steps that we could do is to start learning HTML, CSS, JavaScript using this mockup, just you know, working on that. And I think we should be doing that. Other steps we can do is to start figuring out how the game should work. So I need to figure out who are our partners going to be. Sounds like Josh is a partner. Uh, Charlie will let me know what he thinks. Um, and who else? And then we have to decide what do, are we going to make? Are we going to make it in uh, MERN, which I think we're kind of deciding that we want to do, and how are we going to move forward? And then Ch Charlie and I and uh, um, Richard, I think it was Richard. Um, your name is Richard, right, Richard? Robert. 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 Yeah. Charlie and I and Robert and any of the other teachers that want to be a part of this, we then decide what lessons do we want to run. And they're not going to be the same because Robert's got seventh graders. So, you know, and I know Charlie is doing the HTML, CSS, JavaScript part. But certainly it's much more interesting to say, let's make a console for our game that we're making than to just say, let's all make a generic web page. So what this project is giving anybody who wants to be involved in it is a context to do a whole lot of interesting things. So I'm going to follow up in an email with people and say, would you like to be a part of this? Fill out this form. This the second to last page or the last page of our presentation has got really good stuff to read. And so one activity that we can ask is for the students to go and pick these things and read them and then come back and do a report on each one. They're about very different things. One of them, for example, says that you get all this free stuff. That's number eight. Uh, GitHub Universe talks about all these different ways to use GitHub that we're not using now. Um, anyway, lots of good things here to read and get back to. The one thing that we have is lots and lots of students once we get a few teachers involved to do a lot of the work and move the project forward. And then this is the last slide, which is if you wanted to make a local version of the game, uh, the server on a machine in your school, you could. And that's how. What about like at home? Uh, you could do that at home, too, if you knew how. So um, I'd like to have uh, Robert, Simca, everybody uh, turn, on, turn your microphones on, and let's just start talking. Uh, where sh what are your thoughts? Where should we go next? And students, what are your thoughts? Where should we go next? Let's hear it out. So I can, so uh, I can talk, uh, from, talk the from the C view perspective. perspective. Um, um, I, I, you know, we, you do, know, we, we do, do we do have a class. class. Um, 
what I'm, what I'm sort, of sort of trying to figure, figure out is how we could, could uh, how, how we could make this, you know, you know maybe, maybe just, just a small group, group that's, that's interested and wants to take this on. on. Um, it, because otherwise, otherwise we'd be making, making a pretty sharp turn, turn from, from where, where, what we were doing. It. I mean, it, it kind of fits, fits but we sort, we sort of have things mapped out for the year. year. So, um, what's your, what's your are you doing this like regularly every week? Is that the idea every Thursday? Is that what I understood? Um, I'm. My plan was that if we regularly had a check-in Google Hangout every Thursday. Uh, oh, I see. But we're, you know, as far as the other assignments that we do can be at any point. Got it. Got it. And if you can't make it on a given Thursday, you can just listen in to the recording. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Thursday, Thursday is, when our, is when our class actually meets. meets. So, so that's a good thing. Just, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I'm actually, I'm actually thinking, thinking do we, pull, pull, we pull, pull part of the class and turn it into a club, club that can work more, devoted more devotedly on this project, project as opposed to. As opposed to a full class. You know. You know. You know. You know. Yeah, that's how we operate here. Um, I've got some students who are learning cybersecurity, some that are learning web development, and some that are learning learning coding. Um, and I see certainly the coding people and the web development people having different roles to play in this project. Right. Right. And the fact that they can both be doing different things but have it contributing to the same effort that everybody's interested in because they want to be able to play the games, I think is a really cool, uh, a really cool aspect of having an open source community. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Robert, what are your thoughts? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not quite sure how I fit in yet, but I'm, I'm interested to, to see more of what you're doing. Um, I don't, know I don't know that our seventh graders, graders are quite ready for where you're, where you're at, at, you're at in, the in the project. I don't know what the, what the designing, designing of the modules, the modules will look like. like. Um, if, um, if that may be somewhere that they can come in. I also do, I also am the head of the computer programming club here, and I might fit in with those with those kids, a lot of older students. I'll have to talk it over with them. So I'm just really wanting to get more information as to what you guys are doing. Okay. I think, I don't know if you were on the call when we were talking about how text adventure games work. But um, if we just had students designing the choose your own adventure piece and then have <laughs> other students coding that, that works fine for us. Um, and I know yeah. that, you know, I've got some coders here who may be very happy being given a very specific task to do and then just go <laughs> and do that. Um, so having somebody else doing all the creative work may, in a way, the constraint may free them to, to get better at the coding and not be distracted by having to constantly come up with new ideas while they're working mm -hmm. yeah, well, I yeah well, i think we're it sounds it like, sounds like um, um in my, in my, class, in my later class later on this semester, semester we're going to work on making a text-based text rpg but it's just going to be using it's going to be console based, based just using, just using node, node and uh props <laughs> you know the command line and a bunch and of if then, if then statements, statements slash functions, functions. <laughs> you know, you know I, think I think that's about, about where the kids are, are, are going, to going to be at in their programming experience. experience. My guess is that we're not going to get too much further than that here either. The advantage okay. of working okay. with Simka is that he can build out elements that we couldn't possibly build, but then, then enable us to do other things that we couldn't do. But mm -hmm. this is a multi-year project. I really don't see students being able to code the back end uh, with any great fluency for two years. Or right. More, right. Um, which is fine. Uh, at some point, we're probably going to want to get some sponsors to help pay for Simca and other people to help build the back end more, uh, to help uh, pay for the resources, all that other kind of good stuff. Um, right now, we're just bootstrapping. Uh, but um, but yeah, the, uh, don't let the form dissuade you. you yeah. Want yeah. yeah. That's why, That's why I'm, I'm, interested. I'm interested. I'd like to check out more. Let's see, Let's see, how, <laughs> see how we can fit in. in. Uh, students in the class, can we please get some questions from you? I'm going to turn the microphone over and we'll see, uh, see who wants to say what. Maybe click through some of the things on that slide, uh, that last slide with all those uh, links on it.
do we want to do we want to close the call? Are we all totally talked out? Do we want to suggest some next steps. Uh, Bram, uh, Bram the, uh, the GitHub, GitHub repository is linked on the slideshow, correct? correct? Yes, it is. Okay. Okay. So All right. So I'm going to I'm going to take a look at that. That would be a good thing to make the sense. Yeah, and and uh, and, there, and it actually shows you how you, where you can go to download pieces. Okay. Do stuff. okay. Great. Great. I have a question. Yes, Galloway. So in my experience playing multiple different game systems. Um, I, how are we going to decide what, ah, okay. just because more faces is better. All right, sounds good. Particularly lovely faces like yours. So, in my experience playing multiple different game systems, how are we going to decide which system we wish to use with the numbers and the statistics and the character attributes? Um, to put it in terminology that I'm more familiar with, if I were trying to Watch the recording when they home. program through a boss fight, and I'm using Shadowrun stats, that wouldn't work with someone else's boss fight who's using 5th edition D&D stats. So somehow, this game is going to need to have some sort of solidified baseline for the character stats and the game mechanics. Okay, so um, so if we look at the, uh, the open source model... Um, I'll, I'll sit. Yep. Yeah. So the core code is kind of like your WordPress basic thing. We know that we've got posts and we've got pages and we've got users and we've got plugins and themes. But then there are all these contributed modules that we add on. And you, you take a module, there's a module called an ePortfolio, for example, and it creates a different kind of post and different kinds of features. So by choosing to put that on, the people who made that have to understand how the core works. But then as a game player, I can say, well, for my site, I want to use ePortfolio as I pull that thing in. So this is the, the trick, is how do we get the core code right so that it can accommodate new things coming in? Now, let's say that you have an idea, and it's so far out of whack from what our core code can support that we say, you know, we're not going to be able to, to make that happen with this code. You can then do a fork of the core code and say, you guys are going to make your core code able to do this. The problem with forks is that it tends to divide communities. So you never really want to do a fork if you don't have to. Uh, it'd be better to maybe change some of the ideas. But uh, yeah, we're open to all of it. Excellent. But great question, Galen. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, Joe. Are we going to be using GitHub to uh Exchange code between classes? Yes, GitHub is the way that we're exchanging code. Now, right now, our code is uh, free and open. If we want to pay money to it, we could prevent people from looking at stuff. I don't know at what point we'd ever want to do that. So I think part of the open source quality of our work is to say, here's what our code looks like. Here's where we're at. And maybe somebody comes to our code and says, I'm looking in your repo, and I don't know how this stuff works. Can you tell me about it? And uh, right now, Simca is the only person who can really tell us about it, but other people who know Node React will be able to talk about it too. Um, so documentation of people building descriptions of what are all these different folders and what do they do becomes a curriculum that other people who are learning this stuff can learn from. So that's a whole other aspect to the work that we're doing here. As we're moving forward and doing stuff, we're making resources other people can key into and learn on their own. Cool. Anybody else? Just want to thank, just want to thank you. you. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. It looks, it looks really, great. really great. Hey, you're most welcome. All right. Well, I guess we'll we'll clamp, call, close the call now. And uh, thank you all for participating, everybody inside, out there, all around the world, as Stephen Colbert would say. And uh, we'll see what happens afterwards. All right. Take all care, right. everybody. Thank you.